tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with two audio adaptations of frightening fiction about deadly discoveries and wooded wonders. I'm your host for the evening friend, Steve Taylor, and tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Victory Witherkey and Kate Rouge are voice talents Eric Peabody, Jesse Cornett, Alicia Pavlis, Melissa Medina, and Nick Goroff. Now, get your ticket ready Take your seat in our Theater of the Minds and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first tale of the evening is written by Victory Witherkey and is performed by Melissa Medina, Eric Peabody, and Jesse Cornett. In it, we'll meet an essential grocery delivery worker who finds herself in the midst of a horrible crime scene when she stumbles upon the body of one of her favorite customers. Without further ado, I present to you Essential. The buzz of the flies could not drown out the sound of her retching as the mixture of the chocolate mocha and stomach acid poured from her mouth. The brown and yellow splatter on her black sneakers contrasted against the whitewashed porch steps she stood on, leaning against the matching banister. Out of the corner of her eye, she could still see those vacant eyes, empty black pools gawking at her. This was supposed to be just another delivery run, a new day and then new normal. COVID-19 had wrecked her internship as a journalist, wiping four years of grad school down the drain. To make ends meet, she first took on the delivery services for takeout and groceries, hoping that she'd be back to beginning a fledgling writing career and the Nobel Prize in a few weeks. Instead, quarantine extended longer and longer than her queues of online orders piled up. The work was mind-numbingly grueling. The masks, the gloves, the ignorance. She was nameless, faceless, and expendable, yet vital to the world. Hours of labor darting across the city to get people food, paper goods, medicine at all hours of the day or night. It was routine until Mr. Warren's home that morning when she found his body lying in a congealed blood pool. Kaya did not have much interaction with Mr. Warren. As far as she could tell, he lived alone. A college professor stuck at home trying to figure out how to get on Zoom calls, screaming at his computer every time she made the deliveries. In the beginning, he would have her tip taped in an envelope on the doorbell, but as the weeks progressed, the tips included little notes. The first one was just a simple message. Hi, I'm Drew Warren. Thank you for being essential. 
Kaya smiled when she saw that and left a simple squiggled heart and a cat emoji drawing on the note before stuffing it in the envelope and taking the cash. At least he's a good tipper. A few days later, when she dropped off his next round of fruits and vegetables, a folded piece of graph paper was in the envelope waiting. I'm not sure if the last message means I have a hardy cat to thank for my groceries. A smirk crept on her face before she replied. Sorry, was running behind. I'm Kaya. The heart was an awe moment for your kind thoughts. By the way, enjoy the broccolini. The messages continued like two grade school kids trading notes through a class about their favorite colors and television shows. Kaya learned that Drew was a Taurus, like herself, enjoyed sailing and DJ during his university years. He said he was British, having sailed across the Atlantic Ocean with his father just for fun. Some mornings when she arrived, he'd wave from the windows next to the front door to say hello and thank you, but always kept his conversation to the notes. Kaya believed he was shy, like herself, and preferred to communicate from a distance rather than face to face. She told him of her studies at UCLA in undergrad that led to her pursuit of a master's in journalism in San Diego. She talked of her love of surfing, her Tahitian heritage, and her dream of being a respected writer at the New York Times a female Pacific Islander known for being in a suit instead of a grass skirt. Kaya wondered if she might work up the courage to ask Drew out for a drink once the quarantine restrictions were lifted on their local bars. She'd been working up the courage to ask him out the entire drive over. Sipping her chocolate mocha, she rehearsed the words in her head over and over as her hands turned the steering wheel along the memorized route. Hey, Mr. Warren, Drew, would you like to grab a drink sometime since the quarantine will lift or a bite out to eat or anything? Kaya practically rolled her eyes at the last thought. It had been so long since she had any semblance of a date. Her hands trembled slightly as the familiar pain just below her clavicle ached. Why would anyone want to go out with a grocery delivery girl, a failed journalist, a loser? The negative self-talk was hard to ignore, along with her sped up breathing as she tried to exercise the negative emotions welling in her chest. She didn't want to show up at his front door in tears. She pulled up to the front of the house and put her little black Ford Fiesta in park before swiping the sun guard down to check her face. Her soft brown eyes were accented with eyeliner and mascara, the first time in months she wore makeup. Her lips had no color, as she knew she'd have the N95 face mask on soon enough, hiding any trace of her mouth. At least it means he may not notice how pale I am since I haven't been out at the beach in so long. She would tell the officers who arrived after regaining enough cognitive thought to call 911 that she noticed nothing was off until she approached Mr. Warren's home's first porch step. The first time she noted, there was a crack in the red mahogany front door giving a small peek into his entryway. Kaya could see he owned the same black Hawaiian beach sandal she did, covered in sand and grit as she climbed the step. Mr. Warren? Hello? It's Kaya? I have your grocery delivery for today. She yelled out, hoping she wouldn't startle him too severely. She knocked softly on the door, allowing the momentum of her hand to push the heavy wood forward as the hinges creaked slowly. That's when she saw him, lying naked in a pool of his own blood, throat slashed and eyes empty. His once speckled ginger and pepper beard, now covered in congealed droplets of blood with pale blue lips hung in an unnatural O, oh, as though his jaw had been stretched past the normal range of motion. That scene alone was horrific enough but what pushed her stomach's contents back up her esophagus was his tongue's placement. A floppy, mangled piece of flesh lay just a few feet in front of her, cut from Mr. Warren's mouth and positioned in front of his corpse and her sightline. Excuse me, miss? Miss? Kaya snapped her head back as her field of vision cleared. She sat on the ambulance's bumper, wrapped in a scratchy beige blanket as her body trembled. A young detective, somewhere close to her age, had his fingers snapped in her face, drawing her eyes to his. His olive-toned fingers gave way to a bird tattoo on the back of his left hand. I'm sorry, who are you? She said, barely above a whisper, as though her voice had disappeared. Sorry to startle you, ma'am. I'm Detective Moroni. 
I just wanted to ask you a few questions, if that's okay. Kaya pulled the blanket tighter around her body as she nodded her head in compliance. The only thing her eyes seemed to focus on was the detective's shoes. Brown, leather boots, worn in but still in that classic shape that spoke of the old British workmanship they were probably made from. They were the nicest shoes she'd ever seen on a man. Okay. Can you walk me through your morning and how you found the victim? Kaya cleared her throat, trying to get her voice to stay steady as she began her hoarse description of her morning's events. The bitter taste of bile mixed with dark chocolate lingered in the back of her throat as the words came out of her mouth. The bottle of water the EMTs had given couldn't rinse the aftertaste of vomit and copper on her palate as much as she had tried to rinse her mouth. Did you know the victim personally? What was your relationship to the victim? Asked the detective. His voice was smooth, each word said in the same tone you'd expect on a weekend jazz radio show. Kaya glanced at his face, noting for the first time that as young as he might be, he didn't lack in the looks department. His clean-cut, dark brown hair sideswept with just enough product to keep it out of his eyes. Those dark brown pools shone against his tanned, olive skin with enough grizzled stubble against his smooth skin to show off the powerful jaw. Kaya suspected that he was used to getting his way from the confident way he stood and looked down on her. I can't say we had an actual relationship. I only got to know bits and pieces of him in the past few weeks. I took the grocery delivery job to pay bills during quarantine. He was one of my usual customers from the beginning. What did you know about him? Asked the detective. Uh, I know he was a writing professor at the city college. He was supposed to teach this fall as their creative writing guest professor. I guess he'd had some success as a self-published author on Amazon. He lived alone. He made me laugh. Tears prickled on the edge of her vision, her lip trembling enough that she bit down and looked away, willing herself to take slow, deep breaths in and out. I'm sorry. I understand that this is difficult. Take your time. When you're ready, did he ever mention anyone he was having trouble with? Kaya kept her eyes darting as she shook her head, signaling no. She mentally cursed at herself for tearing up in front of this stranger. Get a grip, you didn't even know him that long. It's not like you were in love. Not like you knew him that well. Okay, I think that's all I have right now. Here's my card, and let me take down your information. If you think of anything, or if you have any questions, please call me. Kaya took the detective's card and mumbled through her cell number. She realized the rest of her orders would not be delivered to the customers in any time frame they requested. Do you think I could ask you to speak to my manager about what happened? She asked, reaching to touch his arm, fingers flexing around the muscle hidden under his shirt. Kaya retracted her hand as though his touch burned her fingers, shocked by the sensation of touching anything. I'll need help to explain why the rest of my shift didn't get completed. Of course. Let me have their number, and I'll call them. Answered Detective Morone with his hand outstretched to her. Kaya took his hand and shook it awkwardly, unsure why he extended it out to begin with. She fumbled in her pocket for her rose gold iPhone X, trying to ignore her hands trembling as she pulled up her manager's number for the detective. He gave her a brief nod before turning to make the call, walking towards the other officers and staff who exited the house with various tagged bags. The clang from the stretcher brought her attention back to the front of the house, the squeaking plastic wheels grinding against the metal screws, the navy blue body bag, sealed and tagged, lay on top of the stretcher, carefully held with each step, closer to the ambulance she was just sitting in. A lump crawled up her throat again as she realized his body was being moved. Her vision blurred, and the only thought she had as the body drew closer was to run away as quickly as possible. Without a thought, she backed away and got into her car, starting the engine and peeling down the street. Kaya faintly saw Detective Morone's blur running out into the road as the tears began falling from her face. A clammy, cold sweat left the back of her black sweatshirt drenched by the time she arrived home. Her muscles ached as she pushed the car door open and made her way into her small rental cottage. 
Kaya lived in a gray one-bedroom in-law unit of five acres of land belonging to one of her old co-worker's parents. It was a compact unit built initially because her co-worker's mother suffered from MS and needed a live-in caregiver to help around the house while her dad worked. The cottage allowed the caregiver to have their own place to rest and recuperate from the day with its small kitchenette and old brick fireplace. When Kaya first moved back to the Seattle area, one of her first friends was Liz, a co-worker at the local paper who helped her get her feet settled in the Pacific Northwest. This friendship helped Kaya through grad school and the passing of Liz's mom. When the pandemic hit and Kaya could no longer afford her rent, Liz's dad invited her to live in the cottage to allow her some peace of mind as the world changed. She dragged herself through the red door, remembering how she'd joke with Drew that they were interesting because they lived in homes with red doors. Red is passion, excitement. Only certain people can pull red off, she had said during one of their morning chats. Maybe that's why I have the ginger hair. I'm just the epitome of passion. Drew smirked. Her body moved on autopilot, ripping her clothes off her skin through the hallways and stepping into the glass shower doors to allow the scalding hot water to warm up her clammy skin. Pale hands pressed against the black marble tile as she let the water's sounds and her squeaky sobs echo through the bathroom. Why him? Why me? Kaya wasn't sure why she was reacting this way. She knew that she and Drew were just getting to know one another, that there were no guarantees, but he was a chance. The first thing that seemed promising in so long, especially since you don't connect with people that quickly, you never have. She closed her eyes, letting the scalding water rush over her face. Images of Drew's smile, smirk, laugh from the past few weeks fluttered through her mind as the tears and clamminess washed away. Drew's laugh lingered in her ears as she pictured their last conversation just a few days ago. That he was gone, out of her life so quickly, brought a heaviness to her chest, sinking into her knees as she leaned forward to rest her head on the cold tile. I have to say that your story has helped inspire me to get back to some of my works in progress. He said, leaning against the white door frame as Kaya sat on the porch railings with her legs swinging. Really? She exclaimed with a scoff, eyebrow raised. How am I influencing your writing? Drew seemed to smile, watching her legs swing back and forth lazily. He was the last delivery of the day, so they had extended their conversation to the front porch. I always have multiple stories in my head and in the works. The one you're inspiring is about a girl who I see as being born as a genius in a third world country, like Mongolia. And it's about how she grows up and solves humanity's destruction of the Earth by creating AI that will help trim our population down. Kaya had stared at him at that moment, blankly allowing the silence to sit uncomfortably just enough before bursting into a fit of giggles. The idea that anyone found any kind of inspiration in her life seemed ludicrous. That character sounded like a female action hero, not an essential worker during a pandemic. I wonder how far he got into that story. Kaya's eyes popped open as she stared at the black marble floor, watching the orange and bergamot scented bubbles swirl and twirl down the drain. She realized for the first time that something was missing from the scene. When she discovered Drew's body, she'd been so distracted and disgusted by the stage, she failed to compute the one item missing from that living room. After so many weeks of walking up to that door, Kaya had memorized the object's placement in the entryway once Drew left his door open. She always had a habit when she was a kid, scanning her environments like a hunter looking for food. As a wannabe journalist, it helped her when she needed to research a particular story or track down a person. Photographic memory of a location was just something she had. She would tease him about his OCD habits of putting everything in its exact spot. His pièce de résistance of this was his laptop, always charging at the front entryway socket. He had told her early that the older wiring in his house left that outlet with one of the strongest currents. Since he often rode in various locations, the laptop was always charged every night in that spot. It was missing from its place that morning, and Kaya just knew in her gut it wasn't a coincidence. Kaya woke up hours later, tangled in her gray and blue bedspread as her iPhone screen kept flashing, 
Her vision was still blurry as she tried to figure out what was going on. She didn't remember falling asleep, but her body moved sluggishly to smack the touchscreen ignore button. Outside her bedroom window, she could see Lake Washington's outline with the orange tinged afterglow of the fading sun. Somehow she had slept the rest of the day away and a large part of her brain wished she hadn't been woken up. The nap she had taken was the only time since the morning she could say she didn't have the images of Drew's face lingering and haunting her. Just close your eyes again. Let yourself try to forget. But as her eyes closed, the jarring image of his dead face gawking at her shot through her. Her heart was pounding in her chest as she tried to coax herself to exhale and remember to breathe. Too much time had passed since she had woken up and the dream world drifted away along with the peace it had given her. She rubbed her temples, feeling the familiar throb of a migraine forming at the base of her skull and sighed loudly. <sighs> Just what I need, a migraine. Kaya had suffered from those terrible headaches since she was a child. At least once a month, she would seek the darkest room to crawl under the covers and endure the pain. Sometimes the pain was so intense her body would force her to vomit endlessly until she convinced whoever was with her to bring her to the doctor's office to get a round of antiemetics and Toradol. Injections and rotations of pills became a norm over the years as MRIs and CT scans came back within normal ranges, never explaining how a young girl could be plagued so severely. It had been one of the saving graces of quarantine, the ability to work around her headaches if she needed to. Wincing, she finally allowed her eyes to squint open just enough to reach out and grab her phone. She lay back down, waiting for her head to settle before turning to see who had been calling her. She had 15 missed calls and three voice messages to sort through from what she could glimpse before shutting the light down again. The first 10 were from her managers and her coworkers. Then the final five were from an unknown number she'd never seen before. Kaya waited another few minutes before opening the missed call log, waiting for her eyes to adjust to the light enough to read. She scrolled to the voicemail section and let the first message play on speaker to give her head a rest. Hi, Kaya. Hey, this is your manager, Bill. Um, I got a call from Detective uh, Marone, uh, Maroney. Anyway, he uh, said that your first delivery was a bit of a shock. Uh, being a crime scene. I've gone ahead and rerouted the other deliveries to our drivers. Uh, take the rest of the week off. Uh, we'll give you the hazard pay. Stay safe. Kaya exhaled as the message ended. A mental break sounded great, and she smirked a little at the thought they'd still be paying her despite the circumstances. There was enough media coverage of the heroics of the essential workers that she was sure the grocery chain didn't want the publicity coming out, saying they had deprived her of her livelihood in the circumstances. It would be one less thing to worry about over the next few days, with the bonus of the free food she'd gained. She hit the following message to play and closed her eyes. Kaya, OMG, are you okay? It's Lori West. You know it's me, your favorite work delivery friend. The rumors are going wild. We got a reroute notice from Shankar about you finding some insane scene on your first delivery. Call me when you get a chance, girly. Kaya snorted loudly enough to jolt herself. Lori was just a few years older, but Kaya often envied how easy Lori could be. She grew up in New York, her dad a big construction head for a long time, never wanting much. To Kaya, Lori was as basic and as unwittingly privileged as they could be. Blonde, blue-eyed, took the grocery delivery to give back and not out of necessity. She enjoyed her Starbucks frappuccinos and gossiping at work about her youth as a champion tap dancer. When the Black Lives Matter protests began, Lori was one at the office who couldn't believe that kind of racism still existed. Still, Kaya felt Lori was trying and couldn't begrudge her naivety of the world because she had felt the sting as a Polynesian girl. She hit play on the last message and closed her eyes again. Hey Kaya, this is Detective Marone. We met this morning at the crime scene. You sped away before I had time to discharge you to leave, so I will need to meet with you again to talk over some things of the case and hopefully get this paperwork squared away. I've called your manager. I hope you're somewhere safe. As Kaya closed out the final message, another notification popped up for a fourth voice message. That's weird, the phone didn't seem to ring. 
Kaya opened the call log again, noting no number showed up with the voicemail, and hit play. At first, there seemed to be just 10 seconds of static playing on her phone. She rolled her eyes, moving her thumb to the delete icon, when a warped, hidden voice began talking. I'd be careful if I were you, miss. Wouldn't want you to get in the same trouble as your boyfriend. The blood drained from Kaya's face as she heard a struggle happening, and then a shrill screaming. Oh, no! No! Please! That's... It's... No. The message clicked to end, and the phone fell to the bedspread, her hands trembling too much to hold it. She could only look down in horror as the throbbing picked up in her temples and her chest. That was Drew. That was Drew's voice. The sun's golden rays peeked over the police station, emitting a soft yellow haze against a blue sky. Kaya sat with her knee fidgeting in her car, parked outside the building, holding the English breakfast tea's final swig. Even with the healthy dose of cream and two lumps of brown sugar, the bitterness of her previous cups of coffee could still be found on the tip of her tongue. She never went back to sleep after she heard that voicemail. In her feverish haze, she got up and took her essentials to the car, feeling the need to keep her presence as mobile as possible. She tried to pull up the records of the number, only to hit a dead end. It was probably a throwaway phone. Knowing that someone had been watching her, she had taken herself back to the start of her days the past few months, parking just at a view of her various stops to jot down as much as she could remember about Drew and their interactions. Kaya pulled her cell phone up to cross-check dates when she first met him, when he appeared to order more items to see her more frequently. She still never stopped her juvenile tendency to mark little nonsensical points in her calendar, like the first time she made him laugh, the first time they elbow tapped, etc. At the time, it felt so silly, but now it seemed essential to plot just how this guy seemed to overstep his boundaries. What kind of journalism were you looking to get into? Drew asked. Oh, I wanted to work for the New Yorker or the Boston Globe, something where I could find the kinds of stories like Jeffrey Weinstein or the USA Gymnastics scandals. I wanted something where my writing would make a difference, Kaya replied, not daring to meet his eyes if he laughed at her. That's interesting. Drew replied softly, almost a whisper to himself rather than to her. I... uh myself was molested as a young man in my private school in England. He was a priest. Kaya gasped quietly, reaching out to touch his hand, stroking his wrist with her thumb. As much as the bile in her throat stopped the flash of water in her eyes from spilling out, she couldn't entirely ignore how warm his hand was to her touch. Kaya had enough unpleasant experiences with men from high school and college to understand what it felt like to be a victim of one who abused their authority in that way. She knew there were no words to say to someone who admitted that. Drew cleared his throat before bringing his other hand on top of hers, rubbing it to assure her he was fine. It was a long time ago, and as terrible as it was, it did open my eyes up to a part of myself that I had been hiding. I, uh, that saying, I enjoyed parts of it. You see, I have had relations with both men and women. I'm bisexual. The slam of a car door shook her out of the memory. Kaya could see Detective Moroni walking towards the front door of the police station. Detective! Detective! She yelled, waving her hand in the air with an empty cardboard coffee cup. The detective glanced over to see the young woman, noting her Eeyore pajama pants and a Cambridge University sweatshirt. Her curly brown hair was thrown in a messy bun with her face somewhat drawn in dark circles under her eyes. How long have you been out here? He asked, his eyebrow raised. It took her a second to catch her breath before tossing the empty cup in the trash can. She looked down at her pajama pants against his gray suit with the icy blue button-up shirt for the first time. Despite it only being a little after dawn, the detective looked as put together and handsome as an Italian runway model compared to her. She blushed and rubbed the back of her neck as she answered him. I've been out here all night. 
I, uh, received a call that may be related to the case. Do you want to come to the station? Or would you feel better somewhere else? Uh, could you give me a minute to grab my phone from the car? And inside is fine. As she locked her car doors once more, goosebumps formed at the base of her neck. She glanced over her shoulder in both directions, but only noted the sea of cars rolling in. She couldn't shake the feeling, even as she followed the detective to one of the private rooms, that someone had been watching her out in the lot. Kaya needed to shiver as she sat down, willing the eeriness of the past 24 hours away so she could relay what had happened the previous night. The silence filled the room as she hit play on the voicemail she received, watching the detective's face as his eyes widened at the voice and the scream from her phone. He quickly took the phone by the edges as she nodded in consent to take the phone down to have it analyzed or at least begin the process. She shivered as the icy blast of AC took the room temperature down, her nails paling against the steel table as she drummed her fingers to fight the silence. Kaya wasn't sure how much time they left her alone, but it must have been a while as her low back tightened against the office chair's hard plastic. Sorry. <sighs> Detective Moroni exclaimed breathless as he pushed the door open, startling her. I just got to talk with my supervisor about the messages and what you noticed about the victim's computer. If you're willing, I think we should go over to the house again today and see what else you notice with some fresh eyes, if that's okay. Kaya couldn't help but give the detective a smirk over the light in his eyes and the excitement in his voice as he spoke. I wonder if he's still trying to prove himself like me. She gave a silent nod and followed him to his car. You did the right thing by coming to us, and I understand your fear. My boss is working on getting a trace on the number from your phone, but I expect it to end in a burner number. But we'll definitely get you some extra security. He said as he drove toward Drew's house. Are you sure that's necessary? She asked, staring out the car window, trying to stop herself from getting motion sickness. I mean... Do you really think I'm in danger? Honestly, it could be a real risk. Someone out there went to a bit of effort to track you down and call you. But I'll be here and make sure you're protected. So far, this is the first genuine lead we've sorted through, and I'm confident we can figure this out. Kaya nodded silently as they pulled up to the house. Her stomach tightened as she undid the seatbelt, hoping that the detective wouldn't notice her hands beginning to shake at seeing the place again. The vision of yesterday was still so fresh as she followed him behind the yellow crime scene tape as he cracked the front door open. It took all the strength she had not to focus on the dried red stain on the hardwood floor. Various spots around the house had numbered signs next to them, remnants of the CSI team's documentation of the house. Okay, walk me through it, said Detective Morone. Kaya pointed out the area that usually housed Drew's laptop. Detective Morone moved a book in the area's place to notice the faint outline of dust, highlighting that something had been moved from the spot. Kai's eyes wandered to the living room and the attached kitchen area as he took pictures. Various hand-drawn sketches of New York City hung on the walls, highlighting the floating bookshelves she remembered him bragging about as he had built them himself. I've got the picture here, said Detective Morone. I'm going to check upstairs in the bedroom for any laptop accessories. Are you okay down here? Kaya nodded quickly, waiting for him to disappear up the stairs before turning her attention back to one of the floating shelves that caught her eye. A rather large edition of the King James Bible lay on its side, an odd book for Drew to have considering all the conversations he'd rambled on and on about how he was a profound atheist. He had turned away from any form of religion after his trauma. She could hear the detective's footsteps above her and reached for the black leather-bound book. It was lighter than she was expecting, as it practically flew out of her hands as she pulled it off the shelf with the rustling of thin paper muffling her swears. Her fingertips could feel an odd divot in the middle of the pages, completely misaligned with the rest of the work. Opening the book, she glanced over her shoulder, her breath caught in her throat. Thick stacks of old, faded $20 bills stacked on top of one another, and another wrapped in piles of old, worn letters and pictures. From the fading paper and ink, Kaya could tell Drew must have been over those letters hundreds of times. She lingered her fingers along with the bundle when one photo caught her attention. Is that- What did you find? Detective Moroni asked, coming down the stairs. 
Kaya pulled the bundle of letters and stuck them in her sweatshirt pocket before turning around. This Bible seemed odd because Drew mentioned he was completely against any form of religion. When I opened the book, I found all these bundles of old $20 bills. He smiled at her as he took the book. You are my lucky charm. We can run the serial number on the bills and trace where the money originated. Excellent work. Let's get back to the station. Do you think I would be okay to head home for a bit? I'm feeling worn down after the last day. She asked tentatively. Oh, yeah, uh, I'm sorry. Of course. You must be exhausted. Well, let's go to the station. I'll start running this and just make sure that your security detail is all set up, and you can head home. Thanks, Detective. Kaya gave a small smile and squeezed his hand, trying to ignore the blush in her cheeks when she realized how warm his skin was. Instead, she pushed to focus on trying to get home as soon as she could. It was early evening by the time Kaya sprinted into her house, barely waving to the officer stationed outside as she closed the door behind her. Her office was in a small corner of the house and had the only desk with enough space to lay everything she had taken out. There were dozens of letters and three photos. The first photo she could only assume was Drew at the private school he mentioned. He was already taller than his classmates, gangly, with his ginger hair radiating through to draw your eyes right to him. His uniform was the standard navy blue slacks and matching blazer with a white button-up shirt and red tie. A few of the adults in the photo were members of the clergy. The first year of high school were the words written on the back. Kaya began reading the letters in order of postmark date, taking notes as she read Drew's hidden journey over the past year. Hello, my name is Drew Warren. I was a student at this school in the late 80s. I'm trying to track down one clergyman that worked with the students. Thank you for your letter, Mr. Warren. We believe you retired and settled with relatives somewhere along the United States West Coast. Check with the parish office. Kaya's stomach lurched as she remembered the sadness and anger in his eyes when he told her of his abuse in that school. Was he trying to find the one who did it? And why the money? Her cell phone chimed, spooking her out of her concentration over the letters out to each diocese. Drew had amassed a trail for whoever this clergyman was. References came up again and again in his letters. Hi, Kaya. It's Detective Maroney. How are you feeling? Kaya faked a yawn before answering. Oh, uh, sorry. Just woke up from a nap. Uh, what's going on? We got a match on the serial numbers from the money you found. You won't believe this, but it ties to a cold case called Norjack. Have you heard of it? No. Kaya replied, shaking her head, grimacing when she realized he couldn't see her. Well, I'm pretty sure it's famous because it's the only airjacking on U.S. soil that never got solved. Basically, in 1971, a guy boarded a plane the day before Thanksgiving and told the flight attendants he had a bomb in his briefcase. He bargained for $200,000 and a parachute upon the plane's arrival in Seattle for the passengers' lives. They arrived in one piece, gave him his demands, and had the pilot take off to Mexico. But he jumped from the plane with the money somewhere between the Washington and Oregon border. Wouldn't he be dead? She asked. Well, that's been the suspicion because he was only wearing a suit that night. I mean, who can land that kind of jump in penny loafers? But they never found a body. The closest they got to a lead was a boy who found some bundles of rotting $20 bills in 1980 while digging in the sand. What does this have to do with Drew? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Now, what would he be doing with those bills? And where did he get them? We'll be doing another search of the house for more of the bills. Did he ever mention this case or anything like it when you spoke? No, definitely not. I heard nothing about that when we spoke. Okay, okay. Well, let me know if you think of something else. I'll keep you up to date if the money trail pulls up any other traces along the way. Kaya hit the phone icon on her iPhone, glancing down at the two pictures left in a pile. Her palms left a sheen of sweat on the back of the phone case as she tossed it aside to sit back down. She rubbed her palms against her face before sighing, 
still in shock and unable to process what she heard from the detective. What the hell is this cold case about? She picked up the second phone, showing two men arm in arm smiling at the camera. They looked around the same age, with dark brown hair and a nondescript face. One wore glasses while the other did not. Cheap, black, plastic, square frames popular from the 80s. Kaya realized the man without the glasses resembled the same priest Drew was trying to track down. It must relate them to one another. Maybe cousins? Or brothers? She flipped the photo over of the two men, reading the inscription from Drew. Relative? Lost contact? Brother? Kaya fell asleep that night with a nagging feeling that something terrible was coming her way. There was something about the other man's appearance that seemed so familiar. Buzz, buzz. Hello? Kaya. Hey, it's Detective Maroney again. We caught a guy using some cash traced to the serial numbers found in the victim's house. It looks like he's low on the totem pole, a higher gun, so to speak. Oh, is there a way to talk to him or, or ask him any questions? I mean, did you find out if he's who left me the voicemail? Well, unfortunately not. The only contact he had on his phone was Mr. Coop. <sighs> Thanks for your help. And I'll let you know of anything else as we wrap this up. Kaya sat up, trembling as she dropped the phone. Her fingers trembled as she picked up the last photo. This was the one that made her gasp and take the entire pile from the crime scene committing her first crime. The photo showed a couple holding a baby with a priest. It was a baptism that was being commemorated. The priest was the same one Drew had been tracking. The last letter he'd received enclosed this photo, marking it as one of the clergyman's last acts before retiring. The man holding the baby in the picture was the same as in the previous photo, embracing the priest as a relative or brother. But the baby in the picture. Kaya knew the moment her eyes spotted the little curls on her head and the white baptismal gown that it was herself in the photo. Her Lola had bragged from the day she could understand how many hours it took for her to sew that gown in time for her baptism. Her mom had told stories of how she met her father working as a coffee barista. She came to the mainland Pacific Northwest hoping to become the next dancing sensation when an older gentleman started courting her. He was so kind, unlike the boys my age. I was young and he was stable and nice, her mom said, tucking her in at night. We never got married, but I liked that he called me Mrs. Coop like we were. How he got this photo of her that day was beyond comprehension, but worse was the realization that Drew recognized her. Kaya, age one, it said, scribbled on the back. Her eyes widened, reading that note that went along with the photo, seeing the misshapen points on the man's blazer. Please stop asking me. Take this cash and leave me alone. This picture is the only one I have. Don't ask anymore. Being watched. It had the same outline as the stacks of 20 she saw at Drew's house. For the first time in years, Kaya stood in her home, wondering to herself as she headed to her bed. Who is my father? I hope you enjoyed Essential, as written by Victory Witherkey and voiced by Melissa Medina, Eric Peabody, and Jesse Cornett. As a reminder, voice actress Melissa Medina's work can be found on the official Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, as well as her website, hearmelissa.com. That's H-E-A-R-M-E-L-I-S-S-A dot com. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by Best Fiends. It was like any other day at work, just sitting here in the recording booth, screwing everything up. 
nailing it on the cold read, then messing up the first sentence as soon as I hit record. Doing a whole chapter and realizing the male character was supposed to be female, and vice versa. It gets worse. The one character was supposed to have a British accent, and I'd been doing Boston the whole time. That's when I decided, this stuff is for the birds. I shut off my computer, pulled out my phone, and retreated to my happy place. The author can wait for his audio masterpiece. Me, I've got business to take care of on Mount Boom. There are slugs afoot. I don't know if that's the right word now that I think about it. A slither? There are slugs, a slither. And my fiends need my help to defeat them. We're talking about best fiends, of course. You've heard of this game, haven't you? It's the best match three puzzle slash adventure game you're ever gonna play. Add to that, it's my happy place. And no matter how bad things are in the booth, it's always a blast up on Mount Boom. Best Fiends combines the best elements of matching, adventure, and even role-playing games. The result? Pure, unadulterated fun. Yes, even more fun than doing your job. Much more fun, in fact. You and your army of fiends, good guys, by the way, are on a mission to defeat the bad guys, the slugs. The fiends start the game as cute little creatures, but by matching objects on your game board and winning round after round, they grow, upgrade, and evolve. As the puzzles get more challenging, your army will take new forms. You'll meet dozens of new fiends along the way and choose your favorite lineup for battle. You don't need to be a hardcore gamer to play Best Fiends, by the way. It's a game anyone can enjoy, from the kids all the way up to Grandma. I was just bragging Grandma earlier that I'm level 200 in Best Fiends, but she shut me down real quick. The old baddest level 300. Joke's on her, of course. There are thousands of levels in Best Fiend, so... Well, she can stay ahead of me forever. There are also brand new events and challenges that pop up year-round, where you can earn exclusive in-game items, characters, and rewards. And with no Wi-Fi required, you can play anywhere, even in your recording booth, while you're supposed to be working. <laughs> eh, work. Who needs it? Come meet me in my happy place for a while. I think you'll be happy here too. So download your favorite new getaway, Best Fiends, for free on the App Store or Google Play. You'll even get $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Thank you for your support, and for supporting our valuable sponsors. If you enjoyed Mr. Peabody's performance, you can hear more of him on the Chilling Tales YouTube channel, where he holds the second place championship title for 2019's Evil Idol competition, as well as recently becoming the new host of Horror Hill. You'll also find more of his work on his website at www.vikingguitar.com. And if you enjoyed Mr. Cornette's performance, you can hear more of him on the Chilling Tales YouTube channel as well as on the No Sleep podcast, where you can hear his amazing vocal performances as well as production. Our second tale of this evening is written by Kate Rouge and is performed by Alicia Pavlis, Melissa Medina, and Nick Goroff. In it, we'll meet Bex a girl who accompanies her friend Lana to the hypnotic new pop-up bar at the edge of the forest. 
She hopes for a night of revelry and quaint Arcadian charm, the perfect remedy for a broken heart. As the night wears on, however, she begins to suspect that within the walls of the rustic and in the eyes of its mysterious owner, there may lurk something not only ancient, but monstrous. Now, without further ado, I present to you the Rustic. Tell me again, I said from the passenger seat of Lana's truck, why are we going to a bar in the middle of the woods? Because, said Lana in that matter-of-fact yet somehow still light-hearted voice, you need to get out of the house and have some fun. Hey, I feigned hurt. I'm fun. Lana turned and stared me down with a look I knew too well. That signature extrovert trying to socialize their shut-in introverted counterpart look before turning back to the road. I gotta tell you, making Excel spreadsheets and sharing paleo recipes you find on Pinterest isn't exactly what most people imagine when they think of fun. Reaching into the cup holder in her center console, she pulled out a piece of hard candy, unwrapped it, and stuck it in her mouth, all without taking her eyes off the road. <laughs> I swear, Bex, for being in your 20s, you act friggin' ancient. I rolled my eyes and scoffed. Yeah, whatever. But hey, oh, ancient one, she said, prodding me with her elbow. Maybe tonight you'll find somebody to worship you, if you know what I mean. Lana! She turned over to me again. What? Come on, it's been almost a year since Matt. My breath caught as she said his name. Yeah, I said, my face falling. It's only been a year, not long for someone who's supposedly ancient. The car went quiet for a long time after that. Sorry, said Lana at last. I, I didn't mean it like that. I just miss seeing you happy. She paused. No guys tonight, okay? Thank you, I sighed. So, what's the deal with this place anyway? It's still new, right? Yeah, it just went up a few months ago. From what I've heard, it's a real hit so far. I scrolled through review after positive review on my phone, its tiny LED casting a dull blue glow across the truck's whole interior. Hmm, I said absently. Do they have good drinks or something? Lana shrugged as she downshifted the truck. Honestly, no idea. I don't think it's the drinks people come for, though. It's the music. Many reviews say their band is, and I'm quoting, hypnotic. Yeah, I said, continuing to scroll through the reviews. I can see that. I guess that means they're good. Lana laughed as she maneuvered the truck and settled us into a parking space in the crowded dirt lot. She turned off the ignition and the pair of us got out, the truck's rusty, bulky doors closing with a loud groan behind us. I mean, there's only one way to find out, she said before coming around to the truck's passenger side, linking arms with me and all but dragging me into the bar. True to its name, the rustic had a pastoral ambiance to it. From the moment we entered, it was as though we'd set foot in another realm. All around us were exposed woods and growing things residing in pots and other receptacles. Many of them are antiques. A kitschy array of items lined the bar's walls, everything from an old wooden ship's wheel to strings upon strings of dangling skeleton keys suspended from ribbons and hung like medals in a child's bedroom. The place was lit by what appeared to be dozens of old-style lanterns within which flames danced and flickered. Though the smell of alcohol was present, I was surprised by how pervasive the scents of rosemary and lavender were all around me. Appearing more than a little overwhelmed by the sights and smells in this strange place, I heard Lana gasp beside me. Wow. As I stood there, absorbing all there was to see in the space, Lana leaned over to me and said, I'll grab us some drinks if you want to find us a table. Nodding, I turned and scanned the packed room. At first, it appeared we were out of luck, that we might have to stand all evening, until I glimpsed a couple vacating the table nearest the stage. Like some predatory animal, I leapt into motion and crossed to the tall, polished wooden table. Before I reached it, though, a tall, scruffy-looking man slid into one of its seats and laid an arm across the surface. As I glanced down at it, that same well-muscled arm bore a tattoo. 
a symbol I didn't quite recognize. It looked like a gender marker, but there was something else. Horns, perhaps? Before getting a better look, the man rolled his sleeve back down over his forearm, covering the mark. I realized then that the man was staring at me with a pair of bright green eyes I could only think to describe as wild. Hey, I said as I approached the table a little more aggressively than intended. I was certain that my own eyes had become a little wild then. I was trying to save the table. I exhaled and cocked my head to the side. <sighs> yes. I figured. He said, brushing a strand of unkempt, sandy blonde hair out of his face, which was covered in a fine, light brown scruff. He looked young, about the same age as me, maybe a little older, but he had an air about him, a confidence that suggested otherwise. You seemed like a woman on a mission, said the man with a playfulness in his voice. So I figured I'd help you out a bit. Oh, I said, taking the seat across from him. Thanks, I guess. The man stood and offered a slight nod. No problem. I haven't seen you here before. The look he gave me was intense, as though he were appraising me. Oh, no. Uh, do you come here often? He shrugged. Sure. I guess you could say that. It's my first time here, I said, my cheeks going warm. First time? Do you like it here? Yeah, I said. I am. There's something about it that just feels... I don't know. Magnetic? Suggested the man. I nodded. Yeah, how do you know I was going to say that? He smiled. Glad to hear you like it. After another moment, he said, I'm the owner. I've spent over a year building this place from the ground up. I wanted to incorporate a little magic. Evidently, I've succeeded. Wait, you're the owner? I asked, leaning in closer. Lana arrived at the table bearing drinks, two Cosmos, and sat. Who's your friend? Asked Lana with a glint in her eyes I didn't know if I liked. Now engrossed, I waved her off and asked, If you've been here over a year, do you remember the man who went missing in these woods back in January? Matt Cortez? My voice was on the verge of cracking as I said his name. Bax. Came Lana's voice in my ear. A warning. What are you doing? Who is this? He's the owner, I said. Maybe he knows something. The man stood back and lowered his head. I heard about that. I take it you know him? Or rather, knew him? It was like all the air had been sucked from my lungs. I couldn't speak. He was her fiancé, said Lana, apparently noticing my dilemma and resting a hand on my shoulder. I'm sorry to hear that, said the man, hands outstretched, voice taking on that apologetic tone I'd heard so many times, too many, this past year. I can't give you the help you're looking for, he sighed. It might not soothe you much, but there's a legend about these woods. The strange man leaned in, resting his elbows on the table before me. They say that the gods claim those who disappear in these woods. Their souls are ancient, rare. That makes them special. It was then that I noticed something odd about his eyes, though there appeared to be nothing special about those bright, wild green eyes. The longer I looked, the stranger they became. Instead of the normal lines and features a pair of irises ought to have, his were like vines, growing, curling, wrapping, moving. They were definitely moving. I pulled back from him. Whoa, what the hell is happening with your eyes? His eyes? Lana looked at me like I was nuts. What are you talking about? I turned to her and lowered my voice, though I knew he would still be able to hear me. You don't see that? I all but whispered. No, what are you talking about? The man gave a little laugh. <laughs> My eyes. He scoffed. I don't get that very often. He blinked and his eyes looked normal once again. Still featureless, ordinary green eyes. Your eyes, they were moving. 
I pointed out to my own eyes as an example. The lines, they, they were moving, like, like tentacles, vines, or something, I don't know. Moving, you say? And then quieter. Well, maybe you're a special soul, too. What? He leaned in closer. I said, that's the sort of thing this lightning will do. I screwed up my face. Uh, that's not what you said. Lana scoffed beside me. Yeah, it is, Bex. <laughs> Are you feeling okay? First you see things in his eyes and now you're hearing things too? I... <sighs> Was I okay? Tapping a staccato beat on the table and glancing up at the stage, the bar's owner said, Sorry, I've got to get up there. We're playing in five. Taking the seat that the strange man had just vacated, Lana said, We'll be watching. With a playful grin spreading across her face. Once the man was out of sight and earshot, Lana nudged me. Dude, he was super cute. Not to mention totally into you. Rather than get into it with Lana, I grabbed my drink and sipped. I mean, had she not seen or heard what I had? Not much later, the musicians emerged on stage, instruments in hand. There was a man with an acoustic guitar, a heavyset woman on vocals, and a shorter, slender woman on bongos. At the back of the group, the bar owner, whose name I hadn't caught, carried with him, of all things, a pan flute. A pan flute in a folk band? Asked Lana from beside me with her face all scrunched up. That's weird. I was sure that her expression seemed torn between laughter and confusion, as did my own. I took a few drinks, finally shaking the sick feeling the stranger had stirred within me. Sitting back, we watched as the musicians started their set. Their first song started slowly, first with a soft tune on the guitar, accompanied by the vocalist humming a deep, rich melody, followed by a percussion. The flutist was the last to start. Last, but certainly not least. The reviews were right. However, there was something undeniably creepy about the man. The sound of his flute, coupled with the rest of the band, was rich and deep and haunting. It was as though each note permeated my very soul. Hearing it for myself, I understood how many reviewers might have been inclined to describe this tiny band's music as hypnotic. After a few songs, Lana finished her drink in a few gulps and excused herself to the restroom, leaving me alone at the table. My stomach gave a little turn every time the owner slash pan flutist glanced over at me, which was often, but at least Lana would be back soon. I looked down at my table then, the surface of which was polished and shiny enough to see nearly every feature of each band's members reflected at me. It was while looking down at these reflections that I saw his face. I shot up out of my seat. What the hell? I said, and was immediately shushed by a patron at a neighboring table. Finishing my drink in one swift movement, I gathered up my things and waited for Lana. That was it. After the band had finished their set and came down off stage, Lana still hadn't emerged from the bathroom. I took a shaky little breath as I tapped my foot, often turning my attention down toward my phone. No texts, no missed calls, nothing. Then, I caught the flutist staring at me, those eyes like a green tourmaline, the lines in their irises moving again. As my skin erupted in goose flesh again at his sight, I shifted my gaze back down to the empty glass on the table before me, from which I pretended to drink. When I looked up again, he was standing not two feet from me, appearing from across the crowded bar as though by magic. You were staring. He said. Despite the noise of the crowd, his voice was all I heard. Oh, I was staring? Yes, you. Said the owner, taking the seat opposite me and cocking his head to one side. While I was up there, you looked at me like I had two heads. My cheeks grew warm. More like two faces. What the hell was that? My face. Yes, your face. It changed up there. For a second or two, you had the face of, I don't know, a ram or a goat or something. A ram? Horns and all, I added, 
though I realized his addition made my claim sound no less absurd. Though I knew it sounded mad, I was sure of what I'd seen up there. I'd seen only glimpses of a face, one that was decidedly inhuman. But that had been enough. Horn. <laughs> he chuckled, a sound nearly as hypnotic as his music. Though he laughed, there was an edge in his voice. How much have you had to drink? <laughs> Not enough for that. I crossed my arms. I know what I saw. And see. See? He leaned back in his chair, studying me. As in, right now? Yes, I said, pointing. Your eyes are still moving. Those same eyes widened and then regarded me with a look I could not immediately identify. Was it anger? Curiosity? Something in between? Fascinating. You don't sound <clears throat> shocked to hear that I saw all that. I couldn't keep my voice from breaking. I wanted answers. What is going on? Goatman shrugged. What do I know? You could just be mad. He winked. If I saw it, I I'm sure someone else here must have too. But... Said Goatman, corking a brow. You were the only one here. What? I gestured around at the bar, but I found the room was empty when I did. Where only moments ago bodies had filled nearly every square foot of available space, there now was no one. The place was silent, devoid of all life, save for the two at the table. Maybe. Said the man. I like a little madness. I blinked once, twice, three times, and the whole of the bar had vanished. I sat alone at the table in the middle of the forest, lit only by the flames of torches and the moon. As I looked around, I saw another table a few dozen yards away from me, seated at the unmistakable figure of Matt. So the hunch had been correct. Something about the goat man was off. He'd had something to do with Matt's disappearance. Before I could cross to him or even open my mouth, the strange man before me changed form. Between shallow, trembling breaths, I managed to get out the words, What? Who are you? Though I got the feeling that I already knew. The face before me was now unabashedly, undeniably that of a ram, the eyes wild and moving once again. The creature possessed the lower body of a goat, but the torso of a man. In one hand, he carried a torch, illuminating that strangest of faces and those wildest of eyes. In the other, he held his pipes. I let out a tiny gasp as the god of the wild stared down at me. Don't you know, said Pan, I'm ancient. I hope you enjoyed The Rustic as written by Kate Rouge and performed by Alicia Pavlis, Melissa Medina, and Nick Goroff. You can hear more of Alicia Pavlis right here on our very own YouTube channel, as well as on her website, aliciapavlis.com slash voice dash over. You can find her many projects there, including information about her movie, Apparition. Voice actor in 2016 Evil Idol champion Nick Goroff's talents can be found on our very own Chilling Tales for Dark Knight's YouTube channel, as well as on past episodes of the Simply Scary podcast. You can also join Nick on his YouTube channel, Wizard of Cause. Now, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again 
turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. <laughs> Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. <laughs> 